Hello there, my ATS EVS students, and this is Dr. Shroggy Shroggy, and I find myself sometimes wondering how environmental science majors do it. I mean, all the news they learn in their classes is bad, right? I almost picture that they have to, like, run, I don't know, like, uh, discussion sessions or something for environmental science majors where they can, like, go pet cuddly baby mammals or something uh, just to kind of get them out of the funk of all the environmental problems they study. I mean, we have spent a whole semester just focusing on climate issues. I mean, we're not even more broadly talking about, like, problems of air pollution and so on. We never even really touched on, like, ozone deple depletion or anything like that. And we discover that not only are things really bad, it's not even clear how to get things back to the way they were before. Or even, for that matter, if that's a great idea, even if we could. I mean, today in this lecture, I want to talk about what even could we do? What even should we do at this point? Um... Are we past a point of no return on the climate system or something like that? And, you know, we've talked about these adaptation strategies, we talked about mitigation strategies, and they all sounded kind of uncomfortable, and then we went into those geoengineering strategies, and a lot of them, it's okay to kind of make fun of them or something like that. Uh, I like, I'm a big Simpsons fan, classic Simpsons fan, and you may or may not be familiar with the show, and you may or may not know that there's an episode where... The, uh, Mr. Burns, who owns the, lo the local nuclear power plant, wants to engineer a shade that would block out the sun over the city. Now, he's not doing it to prevent warming. He's actually doing it to, to, uh, to keep the sun's energy from shining on the people so that they have to use more electric light. Uh, but the basic idea that the, there would be this like grandiose, almost, almost comic book villain kind of plan to, uh, to do something to the environment like this of course, becomes kind of the plot line of the episode. But, you know, honestly, in the decades to come, a lot of these geoengineering efforts that we've been talking about, like changing the the uh, albedo of clouds or uh, adding the sulfate aerosols to the atmosphere or whatever, they might come out to be, turn out to be kind of... Um, they might come out to be ones we consider to be the good options. Okay? In the future, things like adaptation and mitigation might turn out to be... A, a, you know, too little, too late kind of things. It might even be the case that now it's too little, too late. Maybe we have to make some of these unpopular choices. And we already talked about the fact that a lot of these kinds of geoengineering options have pros and cons associated with them. Well, they all do. I mean, that's the nature of any kind of big decision that you make. But we kind of only touched on the issue of whether they would actually work. And by work, I don't necessarily mean as in, like, make the climate cooler. Um would they actually put us back on a path towards the climate that we had before the Industrial Revolution? I have a worse question than that. Is that even really still the goal? I mean, if we got the climate to go... Let's say somehow somebody came up with some wonderful invention and he could snap his fingers and for just a few odd billion dollars we could be back to the climate of 1750. Well, frankly, we're 250 years into this climate regime now. Um, frankly, we're kind of adapted to the climate as it is now. I mean, I'm not, it's not even clear that it's still the goal to get back to pre-industrial climate. Maybe the goal should just be no further change or something like that. But whatever. We would have to define some kind of climate targets and so on if we were going to try to take on geoengineering. Now, when we first started talking about geoengineering... I mentioned that one of the possibilities was this idea of a sunshade in space. And we actually talked a little bit about that on one day, I think it was in the second module of the course, where we talked about the fact that there's this idea that, like, between the Earth and the Sun, you could have a large number of little satellites that are individually, you know, kind of like little umbrellas stopping some of the sunlight before it even got to the surface, before it even reached the top of the atmosphere. Now, this diagram is obviously not to scale, not only between the size of the Earth and the Sun, but actually where these, um, these, these blockers would be, the sunshade would be, is actually better illustrated in this uh, diagram here in the sense that it would just be a small range. But even here, keep in mind, like, from the sun to the sunshade is like 92 million miles the sunshade itself would be spread over a range of about 60,000 uh, miles, about 1 million miles from the Earth. So, like, this little piece right here between the Earth and the sunshade is 92 times smaller than the part from the sunshade to the sun. Okay, so it's hard to get a sense as to what this, how this all is set up. Um, where the sunshade is a very specific point in the solar system called the Lagrange point. Uh, it has to do with the mechanics of the gravity of the Earth versus the gravity of the sun and so on. But... We could do it, but we learned back in the 
second module of the course that um, it isn't really at all practical. The number of these satellites that would have to be deployed, say, in the next 30 years in order to build such a thing, because it couldn't just be a single giant shape like Mr. Burns thought on The Simpsons. It has to be constructed of lots of these little individual satellites. Um, we'd have to be launching, what was it, about one a minute for the next 30 years. But we don't have the capacity to build such th things on that scale. We don't have the launch capacity to build that much. Um, this is not an actual practical idea, but it illustrates that there's other issues. I mean, would this even achieve, even if we could somehow do this, would it actually achieve our goals for our climate system? I mean, there's no doubt about it. This would achieve the goal of reducing the solar constant. Now, I don't know that we've used that word solar constant uh, too much in this class, but a solar constant is just the uh, amount of solar radiation that reaches the top of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, we probably actually did drop that term back in the second module of the course, but, um, you know, we're reducing the solar constant, the amount of energy that is reaching the top of the Earth's atmosphere, and that solar constant, S, is part of that energy in term that becomes the energy balance, right? Uh, when we were talking about radiative forcing or when we were talking about thermal inertia, we had these energy in terms. The total energy into the Earth system, once the Earth became in balance, had to balance the energy out. And so you can see how the energy in is that solar constant times 1 minus the albedo of the Earth divided by 4, blah, blah, blah. Okay. There's no doubt about it. With a solar shade, we could reduce S, the solar constant. And through this equation, you know, if we weren't making any changes to the albedo or anything like that, we'd still be getting a result of, of reducing the energy in. And since at the present time we're getting more energy in than we're letting out, this would address our problem. But is it the solution we would want? Is this achieving our goal for the Earth atmosphere system? Um, I mean, yes, in the sense that for the planet as a whole, the total amount of solar radiation absorbed by the surface would decrease by some fixed fraction, by some scalar constant. We would now be receiving 0.99 of the original amount of solar radiation instead of 1.00 of the original amount of radiation. Um, in that sense, it would work. But wait, there's actually more to that. I mean, we don't receive the same amount of solar radiation everywhere on the planet, but every place on the planet would get it scaled by the same scalar constant. So, for example, the polar regions receive relatively little radiation. Half the year they're getting none at all, right, because it's 12, 24 hours of darkness at the pole. And the other half of the year, admittedly, the sun is up all the time, but the sun angles are very low. So the total amount of solar radiation being received near the poles isn't really very much. It's a tiny number that we'd be multiplying by that scalar constant to reduce it. So like we'd be getting 99% of a small number of radiation. The actual total amount of radiation different is very, very small. You know, maybe a watt per square meter or something different. It's not a very big change at the polar regions. In contrast, at the tropical regions, we have a huge flux of solar radiation. Though average over the course of the year, a tropical latitude receives hundreds of times more radiation than the polar regions do. Well, hundreds might be a strong set, but a lot more, okay? And we're multiplying that by a constant, like 0.99. We're getting 99% as much of that radiation as we were before. But that's a big reduction. So see how we are actually not changing the radiation budget of the poles very much, but we're making a big reduction to the radiation balance in the tropical region when we use a plan like this, like a sunshade plan. Which, okay, averaged over the planet is okay. Aver the total amount of solar radiation being received by the surface of the Earth has now been managed. We've used solar radiation managed techniques to manage that amount of radiation to whatever it is we need it to be to achieve our climate goals and all that kind of stuff. But we end up with kind of a weird distribution of the cooling that we're creating. We're actually getting less cooling near the poles because I mean, we're only t changing their radiation budget by, you know, a watt or something, a watt per square meter. And at the tropics, we're changing the radiation budget a lot. We're having a lot of cooling at the tropics. And isn't that kind of the opposite of what we want? I mean, in our existing strange climate regime, it's the poles that are too warm. We actually had, remember back in Unit 1 when we had, um, when we were talking about like observations of the environment and of the surface and so on. Almost all the observed warming is in the polar regions, specifically in the Arctic region. Um, 
there's actually been very little observed warming in the tropical regions. Not, not zero, but small. And for that matter, that's expected, as we learned in the third module of the course, to continue for at least, you know, till the middle of the 21st century. So, in many ways, yes, while overall we're achieving the planet-wide, we're changing the, the, the temperature, you know, the energy budget the way we want. Regionally, this is kind of a disaster. We're doing almost exactly the opposite of what we want. We really wanted more cooling at the poles and less cooling, less of the cooling at the, uh, there isn't much cool, warming we need to take care of at the, at the tropical regions. There's been a lot of warming at the polar regions. We need to fix that. This would, I mean, don't get me wrong, we're, the, the sunshade plan is kind of sci-fi. We're not going to do this. But it gives us an illustration of the fact that, shoot, it's not even clear how there is a path back to where we want to be. I mean, even if we were willing to spend a few odd trillion dollars on the sunshade, we'd actually in some ways be doing the wrong thing. We'd be making almost all of our temperature changes at the equator, a place that actually has almost no warming, and making almost no temperature changes at the poles, a place that has had all the warming. Yeah, okay, maybe like your ice albedo effect might slow down to this geoengineering. It's not a total waste of time. You are getting some cooling at the poles. But we really haven't done anything to fix... Well, here's the deal. The, the, this solar radiation management plan is well named. It's all about the solar radiation, the shortwave radiation. In fact, the radiation budgets up for the longwave radiation, the terrestrial radiation that's being directly affected by greenhouse gases, hasn't been changed at all. We still have the same budget of long wave up, long wave down, etc. Oh, and that's kind of actually closer to the source of the problem. Yeah, this solar shade idea is dumb. It just doesn't really work out. In fact, all it ends up doing is creating new problems. My guess is there's people in social sciences and economics and stuff like that who could say, yeah, welcome to our lives. Every time you try to engineer a solution, an economic solution, a technological solution, whatever, you set up new problems. I, I suspect that that's true, and we're just seeing that in the context of climate change right now. But this geoengineering solution isn't much of a solution. Uh, this solar shade type, solar management type solution. In fact, it's been studied extensively. There have actually been these really interesting couple uh, climate models that have been run using, you know, simulating what the climate would, regime would be like if we had a sunshade. And, um... The climate just system becomes a mess. In many ways, we don't make things better. In many ways, we make it worse. Uh, overall, you end up with too dry of conditions because the temperature is lower in the tropics where you need that warm air to have enough evaporation of water vapor. Um, the, the, the weather patterns are wrong. This is not a solution uh, for, for our climate problems. So as much as it sounded like a fun idea to build some kind of sunshade in space, the big umbrella in space is just not a solution. There's other engineering aspects of it that are problematic. It's very figure out how, or difficult to figure out how you have all the station keeping of those satellites and so on. Um, but but it's not, it doesn't get us where we need to be anyway. Now, 40 years from now, are we still going to feel that way about it? I don't know. <laughs> we will have to see how we feel in 40 years. But at the present time, it seems like we this can't be the best solution. Um... I mean, our sunshade plan does seem far-fetched. It costs trillions of dollars. But here's the deal. There were actually other plans we could do that would work be better and cheaper. I mean, if we were going to have these solar mat radiation management plans, they would also work for less money. We could, we could change the albedo of the surface of the Earth by different construction materials. We could change the albedo clouds. They would all work. But they all come down to a fundamental problem that I have here in bold. Because of differences in the time scales of solar radiation and terrestrial radiation, all of the solar radiation management schemes just toss the climate regime into some new regime that isn't necessarily better than what we have now. Okay? None of them send us back to the climate of like 1750. They all send us into new strange climates that we don't know. Yeah, maybe the global temperature of the Earth is closer to what it was in 1750. But none of it is really all that close. The global distribution temperature isn't all that similar. There's just no way to get ourselves back to a pre-industrial climate. Again, maybe it's an interesting philosophical point as to whether that should even be the goal. But if we're going to do geoengineering, there needs to be a goal. And right now, we're not even sure what that goal should be and how we would get there. Rats, 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 rats. That sunshade thing should have worked. 
It didn't even work out very well for Mr. Burns in uh, The Simpsons, but that's another story. He ended up getting shot by Maggie. Spoiler alert. Um, before we go to the, the second part of this lecture there, let's answer a couple quick questions. A shade in space between the Earth and the Sun would reduce the amount of solar radiation that reaches polar latitudes, A, to zero, B, hardly at all, or C, trick question, it would not reduce the solar radiation at polar latitudes at all, even a little bit. Which of those is the right answer to what would happen at polar latitudes due to a sunshade? Make a choice for those three options to get a little feedback before we move on to question two.